Lucky Luke is not a reliable archer, since his arrows go all over the place. Another key term is precision, which is a measure of how close the experimental results are to each other. If the results of an experiment are precise, then the experimental method is reliable. In this video, we will revisit factors that affect the reliability of an experiment and explore ways to improve the reliability of results. Remember, a random error is an error that has variable size and direction. That is, random errors affect experiments in unpredictable ways. So even if we have performed our experiment correctly, we might get slightly different results each time due to random errors. Let's return to the example from our first video on reliability. Robin Hood is a superb archer because he consistently hits the bullseye. Even so, his arrows hit a slightly different spot each time. These slight variations in Robin Hood's shots are due to random errors. He is a reliable archer since the size of these random errors is very small. On the other hand, Fluky Luke demonstrates a very large random error. His arrows might hit above, below or to the side of the target. He might hit close to the bullseye or he might miss. Fluky Luke is so unpredictable that he cannot shoot consistently, so he is not a reliable archer. Now, random errors can reduce the reliability of our experimental data. But where does this random error come from? As the name suggests, it is caused by variables that vary randomly between trials. In biology, there are three main sources of random errors environmental conditions, experimental factors, and intrinsic variability. Environmental conditions include variables such as temperature, atmospheric pressure, wind speed, humidity, and light intensity. Experimental factors are associated with the materials and apparatus used in the experiment, such as the masses and volumes of chemicals. Meanwhile, intrinsic variability refers to the inherent differences between samples, such as different locations in a rainforest, different organisms of the same species, and different cells within an organism. Now, how do we reduce the effects of random error on our experimental results? Assuming that we do our best to perform an experiment exactly the same each time, there are three main ways that we can do this. Firstly, we can increase the number of trials that we perform, or the number of samples in each trial. Instead of taking just one measurement, we should collect as much data as possible. So, how many trials is enough? This depends on the experiment that you are doing. Three trials should be considered the bare minimum for an experiment at school, However, you should always try to collect five or more data points to check the reliability of your data. Let's examine Fluky Luke's archery ability. At the archery competition, Fluky Luke's first arrow hit the bullseye. If we looked at this first arrow alone, we'd have come to the incorrect conclusion that Fluky Luke was just as good as Robin Hood. When he fired two more arrows, we saw that he wasn't very consistent. What if, for every three arrows he fires, one gets close to the bullseye? That would make him a half-decent archer. To be sure about this, we should ask him to keep firing arrows. After enough time, we'd find out that he's got a lot of room for improvement, and his first shot was beginner's luck. Since many experiments in biology span over long periods of time, it is often impractical to wait and repeat the experiment after completing the first trial. Let's consider a study to determine the effect of smoking on lung cancer development. It would take decades to collect each set of results since cancer develops slowly over time. Instead, experiments are often designed so that multiple trials occur at the same time. This is achieved by increasing the sample size which is the number of units in a population to be studied. 
Increasing sample size has a similar effect to conducting more trials. For example, even increasing the sample size from one to five subjects will improve the reliability of an experiment. For example, consider two different experiments that are trying to investigate whether smoking causes lung cancer. The first experiment has a sample size of 10 smokers and finds that two smokers get lung cancer, which corresponds to a probability of 1 in 5. This isn't very convincing, since only two people were affected. This could have been due to chance or other factors, such as their diet. Another experiment follows 10,000 smokers, of which 2,000 get lung cancer. While this still represents a probability of 1 in 5, we can be much more certain in these results, since they apply to a much larger number of people. In other words, they apply to a greater sample size. The second way to reduce the effects of random error is to remove outliers from our results. An outlier is a result which is abnormally large or small. Outliers may be caused by extremely large random errors, making them much bigger or smaller than all the other data points. The only way we can spot an outlier is by collecting lots of results and comparing them. For example, let's consider Robin Hood's archery history over the past five years. As expected, the overwhelming majority of his shots land in the bullseye. But what's this? He completely missed the target during practice last Tuesday. This looks like an outlier. We have to find some way to justify this poor performance on Robin Hood's behalf. If we go back, we'd see that Robin Hood was distracted that day. Someone threw a fake rubber snake on the ground next to him, which made him miss the target. This is a reasonable excuse, so he can keep his reputation as the most reliable archer in all of England. Let's look at another experiment where we investigate the activity of catalase. Catalase is an enzyme that speeds up the decomposition or breakdown of hydrogen peroxide into water and oxygen. We set up three test tubes, each containing 10 millilitres of hydrogen peroxide solution with a pH of 7. This means the solution is neutral rather than acidic or basic. Then, one gram of catalase powder is added to each test tube. To determine the rate of each reaction, we measure the height of gas bubbles formed above the reaction mixture. The results that we've collected show a fair amount of variation, differing up to 8 millimetres in height. Since these results weren't very reliable, we decide to repeat the experiment with the same equipment and method. But for some reason, the last measurement is completely out. If we compare it to the other results, we can easily conclude that it's an outlier because it's much larger than all the others. Why did this occur? Perhaps we did not clean the third test tube thoroughly after the first trial. If so, there may have been some residual hydrogen peroxide in the test tube when we reused it for the second trial. This means that there was more hydrogen peroxide available for catalase to break down. Hence, we would observe a much greater level of catalase activity through the production of a taller column of gas bubbles. In any case, we should ignore this outlier when performing calculations. This brings us to the third method of reducing the effects of random error, which is to calculate the average of repeated measurements. The average is calculated by taking the sum of all the measurements for each trial and dividing by the total number of measurements. When we average our results, the values that are too large will cancel out the effects of the values that are too small. Therefore, any variation caused by random errors will be smoothed out, giving a more reliable result. The more data we collect, the more reliable our average becomes. However, when we calculate the average, we must exclude any outliers from the calculation because they are unreliable. Let's see how this applies to the experiment 
where we measured the height of gas bubbles formed through the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide by catalase. Firstly, we need to remove any outliers. Then, we find the sum of all the measurements and divide by the total number of measurements, which is 5. This gives us 45 millimetres, which is a reasonable answer. The values that were too large cancelled out the effect of the values that were too small, giving us a reliable final answer. Now, what would happen if we were to include the outlier when calculating the average? This would give us a result of 52 millimetres, which doesn't match up with most of the measurements that we've taken and is too large. Therefore, it is important that we exclude outliers when calculating the average. Let's look at the types of questions you could be asked in exams about reliability. Once again, these are usually asked in the context of a practical investigation, with questions asking, are the results reliable? Why or why not? How can we improve the reliability of an experiment? And how has the investigator improved the reliability of the experimental results? The answers to each question will vary, depending on which experiment you are asked about. In general, you should think about what random errors are present and how you can reduce the size of these random errors. Before we finish the video, let's look at a sample question. Fungicides are chemicals that are used to treat fungal diseases. Rust is a fungal disease that affects plants causing orange-brown patches to appear on the undersides of leaves. A new brand of fungicide claims to successfully treat rust disease in plants. Dan designed an experimental procedure to test the effectiveness of the fungicide in treating rust disease on a yellow rose plant. He used the following method. Pause here to read the method for yourself. How could the reliability of Dan's experiment be improved? Pause here to think about your answer. Remember, there are three main ways that we can improve reliability. By repeating experiments, removing outliers, and calculating the average of repeated measurements. Dan has only examined the effect of the fungicide on one yellow rose plant so he cannot calculate the average number of days it took for rust disease to be cleared or spot any outliers. That means he'll need to repeat the experiment and collect more data. In general, a good approach to multiple choice questions is to check each of the available options and pick the best answer using the process of elimination. All the options refer to performing or repeating the experiment. Remember, to increase reliability, we can repeat the experiment using the same method and equipment. This means we need to use the same plant species. Option A refers to repeating the experiment with another plant species, the snapdragon. Although this plant is also affected by rust disease, the fungicide might be more effective in snapdragons than on yellow rose plants. Thus, Dan should continue to analyse the same plant species. If he does this, then he can check if the effect of the fungicide is the same for other yellow rose plants. Therefore, option A is incorrect. Option C says that Dan should repeat the experiment using a different fungicide, which is already known to be highly effective in the treatment of rust disease. This fungicide completely clears plants of rust disease in a short amount of time. When the results of the two experiments are compared, we will be able to judge the effectiveness of the new fungicide. In this case, the alternative fungicide acts as the positive control for the experiment. A positive control is a type of control study which produces a known response. It is often included in an experiment to test if the method is correct. We'll discuss this in more detail in our upcoming videos on validity in HSC biology skills. Here, Dan is checking his experimental method to improve the experimental validity. 
This does not affect the reliability of his experiment, so option C is also incorrect. Now, we are left with two options, B and D. Both options refer to repeating the experiment on a yellow rose stem cutting. However, option B applies the fungicide to a plant affected by rust disease, while option D switches out the diseased plant for a healthy plant. Remember, we need to perform the same experimental method each time to ensure the reliability of the experiment. This includes using identical equipment and maintaining the same environmental conditions. Since we used a diseased yellow rose stem cutting in the original experiment, we need to do the same in a repeated trial. Furthermore, the fungicide will not serve any purpose in eliminating fungal disease if the plant is healthy in the first place. Therefore, option D is incorrect, making option B the correct answer. Let's revise what we've discussed in this video. Reliability is the degree to which a measurement or test gives consistent results each time the experiment is performed. The reliability of an experimental procedure can be reduced by random errors. A random error is an error that has variable size and direction. Random errors are caused by variables that vary randomly between trials, including environmental conditions, experimental factors, and intrinsic variability. We can reduce the effects of random error by increasing the number of trials we perform or the number of samples in each trial. In biology, increasing the sample size has a similar effect to conducting more trials as it increases the number of units in a population to be studied. We can also reduce the effects of random error by removing outliers from our results and calculating the average of repeated measurements. An outlier is a result which is abnormally large or small. We hope you enjoyed this Schooling Online production. For more easy lessons on biology, check out our first video on validity.